Hey everybody, welcome back to the NYY Recaps Podcast. We are just 11 days away from the 2020 Corona Ball season kicking off 60 games, a shortened season, or as John Carlos Stanton would call it, a season. I kid John Carlo. I kid John Carlo. Uh, he's actually been pretty reliable over the two previous seasons before last year, in which he just played 18 games. But uh, this is going to be an exciting year. 60 games, that means there's a lot more leverage on every game of the schedule. So for that reason, it's kind of disappointing that we're not going to have a ton of fans in the stands because, you know, with every game meaning so much, the crowds would just be so into it. It would just be electric in the stadium. But uh, I've enjoyed watching these intra-squad games, even though that there's you know no fans in the stands. There doesn't seem to be a ton of energy. For people who find baseball boring, they're going to really find this season boring if there's no fans, because the fans and the energy and the crowds really add a lot to the game, uh, and you don't really notice it until they're not there. Uh, there were talks, uh, they mentioned it during the uh, broadcast yesterday, that Major League Baseball might send out some kind of crowd noise, filler background noise, generic noise that can be played, uh, you know, during the game, during the background. So that way you don't hear all the things the players are, are, are saying to each other. You won't hear guys screaming out F-bombs and things like that. It'll be interesting to see what that sounds like. It'll still sound kind of dead when somebody hits a home run. So, you know, let's hope that parks go above and beyond with things like fireworks and just like loud music, deafening music when guys hit home runs. It's going to be weird not seeing like high fives and things like that after home runs. There's going to be no curtain calls this year. So this is going to be a really unique season. Um, so I wanted to challenge you guys. Uh, I'm actually, a lot of you guys know who's, who've been following from the beginning, I was putting together a documentary about this season, a full documentary of, you know, probably an hour, hour and a half long uh you know, uh, documentary. It's not going to be quite as long now, I don't think, just because half the season is gone. But uh, originally it was going to be called Chase for 28, uh, possibly Chasing 28, something along those lines. Uh, but I think now, uh, because this is, you know, regardless of whether or not they're chasing or if they win their 28th championship, this is just such a unique season that I feel like it needs a more unique title. So I was thinking something like Corona Ball. Um, but uh, let me know if you guys have any ideas of what would you, how would you describe this season 10 years from now? What would be the title that you would use for a documentary about this season? So let me know in the comments. Uh, I want to talk a bit about Clark Schmidt. Clark Schmidt yesterday was filthy. This guy, I was, I am so impressed by Clark Schmidt and watching him in spring training uh, I wasn't as hyped up about him as a lot of people were. I know he was a first-round draft pick. Uh, I know that he hasn't pitched much in uh, in the minor leagues, but that he was very polished as a college pitcher. Um, but when I looked at him, his mechanics looked kind of out of whack to me. I, you know, it looks like he opens a bit too much on his front side, and that can cause you to miss up and away to lefties, up and in to righties as a right-handed pitcher. Uh, and I thought, you know, if he needs to he needs to tweak that and get that under control uh, before he can really be a factor in the major leagues. But, you know, his control has looked tremendous in these intra-squad games, especially on his breaking ball, which is very sharp. Uh, it looks like he's actually got a couple of different curveballs. He's got more of a loopy curveball, and he's got like a hard strikeout curveball. And it just drops out of the zone. Uh, you saw the strikeout against Giancarlo Stanton. Let's take another look at it. This is absolutely filthy, folks. So I think the Yankees are set up in terms of pitching prospects because Clark Schmidt looks like the real thing. They've also got Debbie Garcia. I've heard some people say that he seems like a product of the New York hype machine. I disagree. I mean, guys who are that short and throw that hard are rare. And so it gives kind of a different look to the hitter. He's got a very, very good spin rate on his curveball, a big overhand curveball. His control isn't where it needs to be yet, but Debbie Garcia is coming. He's going to be in the big leagues in the next year or so, and he's going to do well. You know, he might have a similar career arc 
to Luis Severino, a guy who you know might struggle a bit in the beginning, but he'll he'll get it together once the Yankees kind of figure out you know which of his pitches based on the analytics and spin rate and all that jazz, which of them are the most unhittable. And, you know, what parts of the zone he should throw to and how he should work hitters. And he's going to develop as a pitcher. What I really like about Clark Schmidt, what's a really good sign, is that Garrett Cole, probably the best pitcher in baseball, and at least the most studious pitcher in baseball in terms of studying uh, spin rates and stuff, possible exception of Trevor Bauer. But they're, they're you know, both they're similar kids. They're, they're baseball uh, savants in terms of, you know, the technique and Garrett Cole has taken Clark Schmidt under his wing to try and mentor him and teach him all the things that he knows, you know, so that, that could be a huge plus to having Garrett Cole on this, on this team is the way that he can assist in developing young pitchers. So before I get too far into this podcast, I wanted to mention an article I wrote, uh, a guest article for Unhinged New York, which is a Yankees blog fan site. Uh, It's about Jason Dominguez and how disappointed I am that we won't get to see him tear his way through the minor leagues this year. We've seen some teenagers do that before. Bryce Harper kind of dominated single A as a 17-year-old, but The other day I was looking up Bryce Harper's college stats because I remember they were kind of nuts. And as a 16-year-old playing in the uh, junior college circuit in Nevada, he batted 442, had a 524 on-base percentage, a 986 slugging percentage, 29 home runs, 89 RBIs, 88 runs scored, and 18 stolen bases in 62 games. So basically what we're going to have this year. Imagine if somebody hit... 29 home runs and that was before the junior college world series which i think he ended up getting ejected from but he also hit a couple of home runs in that series so bryce harper was one of those phenoms that was just incredible as a teenager we saw alex rodriguez make the major leagues as an 18 year old now he didn't do much until he was a 19 year old uh but we saw ken griffey jr make the major leagues as an 18 or 19 year old if you just watch that documentary junior uh, you know how much of a phenom he was. Uh, Mike Trout made the major, uh, made the major leagues at 19 years old. Uh, I think Melky Cabrera on the Yankees made it at 20, just after his 19th or just after his 20th birthday. So it's not unheard of for guys to reach the big leagues, you know, in their teenage years. What is interesting about Jason Dominguez is that he seems to be way further along. Than most of these young guys. And I've heard people say, oh, Jason Dominguez, he's probably 25. He's probably, you know, hiding his age. Just because people have done that when coming out of, like, Cuba and places before. But uh, since 9-11, we have a pretty good understanding of when people are born, where they're born, who people are. Uh, that type of thing isn't happening anymore. So I really think that Dominguez is actually 17 years old, and I think you'll see him in the major leagues by the time he's 19. He's that good. Scouts already think that he's an above-average major league talent in terms of his physical skills. Now, how does that translate into you know being a kid in a new country and developing with the culture, especially during a time when things are just absolutely bonkers right now with you know, this unprecedented coronavirus situation. So he's got a lot of development to do. Hopefully the Yankees are, uh, you know, devoting some resources to, you know, making sure that he can keep his head on straight and that, you know, he can continue to develop during this time when there's no minor league season because it'll be a shame if if Jason Dominguez gets delayed. And I really think he'll he'll be in the major leagues at 19, and I think he'll succeed right away. He's uh, just from everything I've seen about this kid – He's off the charts. A few other things we need to talk about. Aaron Judge was pulled from yesterday's intra-squad game with a stiff neck. Now, obviously, Judge, you worry every time he gets hurt because he's so important to this team and he's had so many injuries, but Aaron Boone said he doesn't think it's serious, thinks he'll be back in there today. So I'm going to take him at his word. You know, we've heard that before. I remember something similar happened with Aaron Hicks last year. He had a bit of a stiff back. Thought was he'd miss two days. Ended up missing maybe eight weeks. Our training staff sucks. It's terrible. 
And from everything I've seen, the new training staff that they've replaced the old training staff with sucks just as bad. So maybe it's, it's something in the water. I don't know. Maybe it's uh, something in the weight room. But guys keep getting hurt. Uh, and until I see Judge get back out there on the field at 100%, I'm just going to assume that he's not going to be in there. So uh, Miguel Andujar, uh, how are you going to get him at, at bats? So I did a little piece about Miguel Andujar earlier this week. I was just kind of riffing. But Michael Kay had a good point. You know, with each game being that much more valuable – uh, this year, each loss counts as basically three times what a normal loss would be. And so you can't afford to give up out. So his thought was, you know, maybe they don't put Miguel Andujar in the outfield. And my opinion was Miguel Andujar is going to see a lot of time in the outfield. Now, I didn't see his plays where he messed up in right field last week. Uh, but, you know, uh, those things happen. It, he's learning the position. Jack Curry actually had a really good point when he was going back and forth with Michael Kay. He said that, you know, Gio Urshela isn't going to play third base seven days a week. He's going to get a couple days off. Everybody will. In right field, Judge will get a day or two off. Stanton will probably get a day or two off in left field or at DH or whoever's playing left field, whether it's Talkman or Gardner. Guys are going to get days off. And Miguel Andujar is a guy that, you know, he's not great at any one defensive position. He's pretty much only great with the bat, but he's serviceable that you can move him around and find ways to get him at bats. Now, I don't think they even considered the analytical portion of this, which is a lot of times, you know, the, the front office kind of knows what the likelihood is of a ball being hit to a certain player on any given at bat. They know how guys do against certain pitches. They know how guys do against certain types of pitches. So if they're working a guy with breaking balls away, they know they're not going to pull it to left field unless it's a hanger, which you know does happen, and you got to be ready for that. But for the most part, uh, that's why you see the shifts as strange as they are, where you got guys swapping back and forth. They're trying to give themselves the best percentages to make a play on any given out. So, you know, let's say you got a guy up there, a big left-handed hitter and you've got Andrew Har in right field and you've got Aaron Hicks in center field well maybe you just swap them for one batter if there's a high percentage of the ball being hit out to Andrew Har so you know that's something they didn't consider I think we're going to see Andrew Har get a lot of at bats I mean you saw the home run off of Garrett Cole the other day in the inner squad game the guy can just flat out rake he can rake to all fields and he doesn't just hit singles he gets extra base hits he does damage and as a rookie, I think his, his OPS was like 846 or something like that. Imagine what it's going to be when he becomes a more mature hitter, when he starts to understand, you know, how, he, how pitchers in the league like to work him. And he gets to go through these pitchers four or five times. You know, even in my summer leagues, which is just, you know, a bunch of old guys, ex-college players, ex-high school players, things like that. Occasionally you get the ex-minor league player. But you get to see pitchers a couple times a year. And each year, after you face them a few times, your brain just kind of remembers how to hit off of these guys. So there's this one guy who throws a sinker. He's pretty much got the best sinker in the league. And I always just hit a ground ball to shortstop against him. So last year I said, you know what, I'm going to move up in the box and I'm going to hit that ball before it gets too low in the zone. And I got a couple of hits. So, you know, you've got to adjust – uh, I think Andujar will adjust. I think he'll continue to get better. It won't surprise me if he's a 35 home run, 50 double kind of hitter in a couple of years. I mean, that's just the type of guy he is. And final thing from today, Masahiro Tanaka appears to be alive and well. He was throwing in the bullpen yesterday uh, before it started raining. Actually, he was throwing in the outfield. But uh, after he was done, he took a ball and threw it up into the stands and tipped his cap you know, pretending there were people there, which, you know, it's a good sign that he's in good spirits. You know, he's feeling okay. He's feeling like joking. You know, there are two possibilities, you know, when things like that happen. You can either uh, be scared and, you know, basically never go back on the mound again, or you can get right back on the horse and be like, all right, I took the best shot I can take. You know, John Carlos Stanton is one of the hardest hitting uh, hitters in baseball. He hit one one twelve off of Tanaka's head, and he took it. He just took it and got up, dusted himself off, and said, what? 
So, hey, if I'm Tanaka, I'm thinking, hey, I can take anything. I can take the world on. So glad that Masa is feeling better. Uh, hopefully he won't miss too much time and we'll be able to have him for the season. I think he'll be okay. Uh, thanks for watching. Of course, like and subscribe. We've got game day shows coming up soon. I'll try and do one or two of these podcasts every week. Go read that article from Unhinged. I'll see you next time.